Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you just got me excited. Like you could get paid, someone who has a job that, that makes $50,000 a year gets paid at the end of the month or at the end of the week. Like you could literally start it where you just get paid per minute. Like, and you instantly are paid per minute. Like I could put a record out right now and be paid and, and advertise it in the sales that I put out, that, you know, I made tonight. You know what I'm saying? Like, like there's so much cool stuff that can be done with, Bitcoin that never that always had to have banks involved in processing like especially in the workforce like if you want to hire somebody per hour you can say okay you're the minute you clock in you're getting paid per minute in Bitcoin when you clock out at the end of the day you have enough money for dinner to take your family out for dinner do whatever you know get groceries for the next day like it can change the process and make it so much quicker sorry go ahead <laughs> Yeah, it, it'll definitely make things quicker. Just knowing that once you get paid, you don't have to wait until the next business day for food to be on your table. That's useful to a lot of people. Uh, but what I was saying is there's a great article by Nick uh, Zabo on his website uh, about time as a measure of uh, human sacrifice. And it talks about how European society jumped ahead and really gained its, its uh, prominent standing in the world due to advances in time technology. First, you know, the hourglass and then the mechanical watch and then more and more accurate versions of the mechanical watch. And uh, it's a good article, but basically, or a good blog post, I mean, but basically the premise is that once you have a uh, truly fair time that is not distorted by unfair, uh, unfair employers, unfair lords of certain areas, once it's a just unbiased objective thing that everybody can tap into, you have very fast advances in the economy because now even the people at the lowest rungs of society, the day laborers and the peasants can negotiate for their labor time, can set their own rates to an extent, and they know when they're getting screwed for the first time ever. And they can precisely measure how much they're earning. Of that, you eventually get a, a functioning labor market and then within a couple hundred years, you get stock exchanges and everything we have today. You get the computer revolution, all from improving our measurement of time. So if you take that idea out far enough, what happens when we improve our measurement of currency by a similar jump? Uh, we're going to get so much new fairness in the world that we haven't thought about before and new efficiency that we haven't thought about. One idea that somebody uh, tossed out there, I think it might actually be in development now, is uh, to sell your Wi-Fi in exchange for just little amounts of Bitcoin. So yeah. if you're in a public area and a traveler happens to be passing by for a couple hours, a couple hours, their software can tap in automatically, pay some pre-negotiated amount, and you have Wi-Fi and it's seamless, and you haven't given your money to some creepy multinational or some you know expensive some expensive monthly subscription. You're just using internet as you need it, and uh, all that stuff is coming. Yeah, man, it's brilliant that yeah they they do have this router or it's either in development or I'd read that article too, uh, where you like when you're not home, you know your Wi-Fi is like running all day and you and everybody in the neighborhood, like I, an article I read about this was saying how they can like node out a little bit so it's like everyone in the neighborhood is essentially sharing and paying for this Wi-Fi that they're all using, you know what I mean? And it just kind of is these mini exchanges of money. Again, back to this micro exchange, instant micro uh, transactions thing. It's so brilliant. I mean, you know, they there was even an article I read about the concept of spam and they said if they started um, charging these micro transactions for emails and then you were mining uh, these micro bits of uh, Bitcoin it, it would, you would never, to you, you would never even notice that there was money being exchanged hands, but, but what, what that would cause is a group that spams millions of emails out would now have to pay money because that, you know, a couple emails a day, you're mining the small amount. It doesn't matter, 200, 300 emails a day even. But like these people that are sending out millions of emails a day would then have to fork up money to be able to do that. Things like that is that fairness that I think is going to creep into all these different areas where all of a sudden people who take advantage of these free technologies will be penalized, but people who don't will be, you know, I have access to it for free. So it's really wild. I can't wait to see that happen, you know? Yeah, I think uh, we're so far ahead of the curve. Anybody watching this, you and me, anybody in Bitcoin at this point, at this point is so far ahead of the curve because the idea of fair currency is going to take the world by storm just because of all the things you can do with it and the fact that you don't need a common PayPal or a common bank or a common country or nationality. And I've read more and more into the smart contract stuff. And I was initially, uh, I wouldn't say skeptical, I just really didn't understand the impact of it. 
And I think that's due to all the language being kind of, uh, it frames it in the idea of it being a replacement for legal agreements. But right. I think what it really is, is a replacement for the organization. So if you're, a, if you're like a, a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo, even when they start accepting Bitcoin, which I think is inevitable, you get enough Bitcoin users, then Kickstarter will accept it. Uh, you're still relying on that institution of Kickstarter to be there and to hold the funds until you know a certain amount is met and then they distribute the funds. And uh, they're doing these things that we trust them to do, but it costs them a lot of money to do it. And they're charging a fairly substantial portion of the money that comes in, like five or 6% to do that function. So if you can replace that with computer code that is you know, replicated all over the world over a blockchain, and you can have open source computer code that says, when you send X amount of Bitcoin to this address by such and such a date, as long as this funding minimum is met, then everybody's money will go to this person. But if it's not met, then all the money goes back to the original senders. And they're at the point now where they can actually code this. And pretty soon they're going to be able to code things that look like publishing houses and say, you know, if your record sells X number of copies or your, if your book sells X number of copies, you'll get an 8% royalty. If it sells that number and then this amount on top, you'll get a 10% royalty. And the fairness of this isn't dependent on some publisher in New York deciding not to screw you when you're not looking. It's actually based on the fact that it's computer code and there's nobody there to screw you even if they wanted to. So that idea is gonna take hold. And it's kind of scary to think how futuristic things might get when you're working for a company one day that has no physical office. It'll just be a full Uberizing of all these different industries. Yeah, man, God. I mean, the ident office of identification, all these different things. Like now there's a permanent digital ledger. So like identification, birth certificates, weddings, like uh, all of that stuff can could honestly be thrown into this. And with, and people say, well, what happens, you know, when the internet goes away and it blacks out or whatever. And if that happens, I mean, it's, it, we're getting to a place where there are be, beyond that, you know, the ideas of like uh, Jeff Garza or whatever, wasn't he going to launch a satellite that backed up the, the uh, blockchain in case like something happened on earth, it would be one orbiting. But, but in, in, on, a, on I think a bigger scale, I think what we're going to start seeing is, for instance, uh, this is a good example. Uh, have you seen these things, these coin cards? Uh, have you ever seen these? The, the coin. No, I think I saw the I saw the crowdfund for that a while ago. What does that do? I, I support I supported it. I mean, it's re it's really cool because it you basically use an app and put all your credit cards on it, and then you can you can push this button and switch between your different credit cards, and then just use it in a place. So you just really only need to bring this one thing everywhere you go. You know what I mean? And if you walk too far away from it, your your phone will tell you you've left it. Now, this isn't Bitcoin technology or anything, although you could get one of those Coinbase uh, cards in, included in this, and then it would be. But what, what's cool about this is it has this functioning menu that doesn't require any battery or any charge or anything, and it communicates via YouTube. I mean, by Bluetooth, sorry. Um, so I think we're going to start seeing uh, the separation of electricity in the internet. And I think that's where everybody's mind is right now that like if the electricity isn't working, the internet won't work. But I think we're going to start seeing these very low voltage technologies that, that self power, self charge. Uh, you know, there's lots of patents that are, that are, getting into this like self-charging stuff, solar panels being put onto the backs of phones so that they are, they, they are charged all day as long as there's some sunlight. So I think we're gonna start seeing um, a lot of these different new energy, the new energy thing, which is totally separate from wow. the blockchain and all that, but I think it's all gonna come together to a place where people are gonna realize that the internet is something very powerful. I mean, it's, it's very, it's the biggest, the, the world changed so much, I mean, I think a lot it really, of really did. It's funny. It's funny that uh, Satoshi created this invention and released it open source. And it was in response to the uh, stifling inefficiency and unfairness and slowness of the banking system. But now we're coming up with use cases that have nothing to do with banking and nothing to do with money. And it was that creation of the blockchain that will, you know, according to some of these papers I've skimmed over, it's these blockchains that are going to be the gears that allow for different devices to communicate with each other. And for example, you know, in a couple of years from now, if you have some solar panels in your backyard and you decide to become a solar miner, uh, you would be able to sell your solar power back onto a, a larger grid and get paid in Bitcoin for it. 
and you'd be negotiating the you'd be negotiating a smart contract with some distributed company that then would just pay you a royalty for your solar time. So we're getting into some really weird ideas that are now actually uh, approaching reality due to the fact that blockchains can communicate. And now all these different technologies can uh, come to some kind of consensus and share information in a way that's safe. And that has never existed before. I mean, decentralized solar power, I've never thought of that in my life, but think about an entire decentralized ele electrical grid that, that, <laughs> powers, that powers electrical cars. So there's no fuel, no carbon footprint of any of sort. It's all powered by decentralized power. I mean, that would be just insane. Well, we're, I mean, we're, we're getting to a weird point where people are, <laughs> people are taking the decentralization thesis to some logical extremes. Like you don't need a power plant anymore. You don't need pretty soon an ISP. You know, you won't need to pay a Comcast or a Time Warner for internet access because you'll be able to do the, the Wi-Fi thing we talked about. Yeah. That's a, that's that is a new world. It is uh, it's going to be two pronged though, because not only better technology, better finances. The way that money is created is now going to make a little bit of sense because it's going to have a relationship to computing, and that means that everybody's going to be able to look at the source code and decide for themselves: is this fulfilling what I need it to do? And if not, how do we design it so that it does that? Yeah, that's very true, man. I mean, and you know, it, it's it's just the 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 Wi-Fi thing is like just right around the corner. You know, did, did you ever see that thing, that device that Mycelium was developing, where it was a cell phone that didn't need cell service because it worked off of the closest nodes? Like basically, if everybody in this neighborhood had a phone, you know, say one person every five blocks, or let's look at New York City, five New York City blocks had one, mm -hmm. then they would the the network would work off of all the phones that were near you so there wouldn't be no need for the cell towers and stuff and, and like that kind of a concept just is so wild because any that can be applied to so many different technologies of communication if you're just like you know if there's enough people in an area that have it it'll just bounce around the world you know and that's that kind of concept is just very fascinating and i think that like all these companies are they saw the blockchain thing and they're like oh wait a minute if you can do this, then we can do this. And like you said, we're about to see this generation grow up and the generation below us is going to come up with some really wild shit, you know? Yeah, they are. I mean, some of the already some of the biggest innovators and coders in Bitcoin are people in their teens and early 20s. So we're getting yeah. uh, we're getting lapped by the younger generation. And I'm happy to see it because we need we really need technology to take the take the helm here because nothing else seems to be working. This is the only way that people are getting some degree of economic freedom is is new technology. It's not coming from government. It's not coming from uh, really anything aside from more efficiency through technology. And uh, we just need to support that in every way possible because you know you mentioned the encryption thing. I don't think they're going to be able to succeed with that either. But they can certainly slow it down, and they can certainly make it so that the U.S. is not one of the areas that prospers when you know Bitcoin is worth fifty thousand dollars a coin and when everything's running on a blockchain and it's this new world, why should we be shut out of that because of some old school bureaucrats? So I think we all need to also keep an eye on that, like that bit license thing uh, seemed like kind of a travesty for the whole uh, community. You know, there are websites now that make sure before you use them, they make sure that you're not a member of, uh, you're not a resident of Syria, North Korea, Iran, or the state of New York because they can't comply with the regulations in those areas. Uh, so we need to avoid that whenever possible. I agree, man. I, I think the bit license thing was dumb, and I think it was it was created to slow down the advancement of this process around Wall Street. I think for sure, like those guys saw it and were like, "Fuck, we got to keep this." <laughs> <laughs> so they did see. I think they did see it. And were like, "Shit, this is not good." And we can buy ourselves two or oh. three years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were pissed, man. So you know, but it's awesome. Like th this side of the world, dude. Like L.A. especially. Like I, I have. I love that LA is so forward thinking with this and LA also, I think wants to separate itself from the Bay area a little bit. And so they've been very positive in, in supporting it. Colorado, like this whole side of the, the United States has been pretty wide open about a lot of pretty advanced ideas. So it's cool to be on this side. I'm glad I'm not over in New York city. I went to the Bitcoin center. I was in New York this summer and I, I was like, I'm going to go check that place out, man. And they, they had a, a bunch of mining machines on a table and they had some paintings that they, they were selling with Bitcoin and they have like pizza parties. I mean, it felt like kind of like a 
a, like a little nerdy hangout thing. It didn't feel like this bit center like I thought it was going to be. It was just like kind of weird. But they had an ATM that was unplugged and you couldn't use it because of the bit license thing. So it was just sitting there. I'm like, this is shitty. They're like, well, we're having a pizza party on Thursday night if you want to come back. <laughs> Watch the rise and rise of Bitcoin. I'm like, that's cool. I've seen it. <laughs> you know, no, it's, it's it's true. That's that was the travesty of the bit license is you had people in the United States terrified to trade in bits or to innovate around bits because they're worried about going to jail. It doesn't make any sense. I think if a guy like Ben Lossky were around when Steve Jobs was starting up Apple, Apple's garage would have been fucking raided. You know, Wozniak would be on the ground. Uh, with handcuffs around him because it just sets the bar so high to think that these little tiny startups throwing pizza parties are going to be able to comply with crazy regulations in the same way that a JP Morgan Chase can that can easily afford $10 million a year in lawyer's fees. It's just totally insane. And the whole point of Bitcoin was that you can be your own bank. And they tried to make it so that it's like, oh, you want to be, you want to be one of us? Well, then you're going to have to pay the cost that we pay. And it doesn't make any sense at all. It'd be like saying you need to pay postage on every email you send. Uh, yeah. So I'm glad to see that other states have not taken that have not taken that route. And I hope New York eventually fixes that because it's just crazy. I think they will, but I think it's gonna it's gonna you know the devastating effect that the slow devastating result that was set into motion when Bitcoin was created for the banks, that's going to have to get a little deeper into their sides and twist before that fixes itself there. But it will, man. Those are the most corrupt, most criminal people. In, are in the money business and you know just because they want to i mean there's always going to be scammers there's always going to be people like that but the banks and the wall street and all that there's so much like theft and and i mean murder and things going on centered around these these corporations well, and, even even if you ignore all the people who are mysteriously dying in the banking sector you set aside that stuff and just stick to what we know from headlines in USA Today and the New York Times. These are people who have foreclosed on millions of us after getting this massive taxpayer funded bailout, which is basically institutionalized theft, open day theft. Uh, hasn't really ever been explained to us fully where that money went or why it had to be done at that specific time in those amounts. Uh, but aside from that, every year by just just by default, they take $30 billion out of our accounts and overdraft fees. That's been widely reported. So that's six times more, sorry, five times more than the total market cap of all Bitcoin in the world. And that's being routinely robbed from people every year. And it's being robbed from mostly the people who can least afford it, like college students and single mothers and lower income people who hit that that uh, threshold and get the overdraft fee and then it charges them five at once. Everybody's experienced this at some point, I think. And the banks are doing this. They're using technology against people. With Bitcoin, the ledger doesn't work against you. When the transaction's sent, it's actually sent. It's not like they're waiting to pile up five transactions to fuck you over. And yeah. just having that, just having a technology where the basis is not to fuck you over and is not to make money off of you. The basis is just to transfer information very quickly. And it just so happens that that information is a, uh, a ledger of values that you gave a certain number of points to somebody else or they gave it to you. But it's doing it in a very fair computer science-y way. And I think as more people realize that the power there uh, could be significant. Yeah, man, for sure. I agree with you. And I think, uh, you know, it's just exciting and I just can't wait for it all to to see where it's going, you know, because as much as I want to predict or dream about it, I know it's going to take a form that that is even far more crazy than I thought it was. And I can't wait for all those criminals to get the best thing for them is not to get thrown in jail. It's for them to all go broke because that's the one thing they don't want. And I think when their money's not valuable anymore and and people are in control of their finances and honestly, the term money and the concept of all of it. It, 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 I think our heads will really change. The, the generation below us and the one below them will really look at money in a very different light, you know? And I think that's, that's a very exciting thing. Yeah. So if you're out there watching this right now, we have time for one or two questions. If you want to tweet us, I'll check it out and uh, read off some of the tweets. But uh, yeah, it's a very exciting time. And I think it's going to lead to some weird things as well, possibly a Skynet type of thing down the road where you could be a shareholder in a autonomous organization that is semi-sentient. And we're, we're not there yet. We're probably at least 10 years away from that one. But that's where it's all leading to is that you could actually own shares in a company that is buying and selling uh, computing time on these sentience networks. 
and is solving humanity's problems. You know, like we could have think tanks that are not human in nature, that are just computers racing against each other for little pieces of Bitcoin or some other reward. And uh, it's going to be cool because for a while it seemed like technology was only leading us toward more and more advertising and entertainment and surveillance. And uh, that came up in the IBM report. They said that the world is, has been creeping towards ubiquitous advertising and ubiquitous surveillance. So the blockchain offers us a break from that, that we can actually create new ways to monetize our content, aside from just shoving as many ads as possible onto a web page. Yeah, and not really making any money off of it either. I mean, it's just so much money. Google and these companies, like I, I'm a fan of Google and their innovation and I, and their intent for the most part. I am. I can't be angry at them. I'm not. I I, I love old machines. I have an old Apple IIe here. I like Apple. I, I'm an Apple enthusiast in the early years of Apple, but I, but now I'm not. I'm not very much of a fan of the way that they've done things, especially with music and especially with with kind of their with the iPhone. How how the experience, in my opinion, is with an iPhone is so much less free than an experience with like an Android and what you can do with it. But, you know, that being said, I guess I would be more of a Google fan, but at the end of the day, all, all these companies are making billions of dollars off of, off of every single one of us. And we don't even know that money's there. And that, and now I think, like you said, with the timepiece, as this, as we get more into this and the internet starts changing in the favor of this open thing, people are going to start becoming much more, aware of how much everything they do is worth on the internet and what they should be getting and where's that money been? Where is that value been? Like the time I spend doing things can be rewarded in different ways that are not, we're not even aware of, but these other companies are making tons of money off of it, you know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, just one quick example of that. Uh, long before we get to these uh, semi-sentient networks uh, racing against each other to solve problems, we'll get to a point where instead of banks hiring these douchebags in New York for 200K a year each, these guys who only graduate from the same business schools and just get drunk every weekend, and they're not producing really innovative investing ideas, they're just overpaid, uh, you know, overpaid uh, property essentially, overpaid servers. They're not being, they're not really all that useful to these organizations, but they get paid all this money. In the future, you could have banks uh, crowdsource their research and you could be a part-time bank analyst living in the middle of nowhere. You just log in in the morning, you do a few hours of work, you get paid in Bitcoin when you predict something correctly and you tap into some kind of weird global prediction market. They're working on all this stuff now too. Yeah, Augur. Uh, these, these, yeah, Augur. I did a, I did uh, so all this crazy shit could happen in the future where people who are in corporations right now and are just glorified servers or just glorified property are gonna be replaced by enlightened free agents, by freelancers who are doing things that in the past were not freelance tasks, were more like upper level uh, management type stuff. Um, big fan of Apple as well. Obviously I have an iPad, fan of Microsoft in its own weird way. They've, they've pushed forward a lot of innovation. Uh, fan of Google too. It's impossible to be a YouTuber and not to at some level appreciate the billion unique viewers that you're exposed to. You know, when I check my stats, I don't like the fact that they take half the money, but I do like the fact that like 50 to 60% of the people viewing me every month are new people coming through YouTube search. So I totally respect what they've accomplished, but I think the problem is we're seeing now that like Apple and Google and Microsoft and anything that is a corporate top-down structure that has to answer to shareholders every quarter and that has to answer to the government on every single line of code it writes, you know, the possible ramifications we're reaching the upward limit of innovation within those structures. So the real innovation happening in computer science now is not happening at Google. It's happening in wherever the fuck Vitalik Buterin is and wherever Gavin Andreessen is. Those are the people who are driving the innovation. And it's surprising some of the people on Wall Street because they're expecting the big releases to be coming from Google still. But the big releases are on GitHub and the smart people are starting to think through this stuff and think, shit, this is a really big deal. And it's actually trickling from the bottom up. It's like this, the rich people are finding out about this one last, which is really weird to see. Yeah, it's cool to see. It's very, it's very like, you know, rev it, that's where revolution happens, you know, it cut from the bottom up. And I think that, that we're in it, we're in that place. It's very exciting. I, I, you had me laughing about, about the, all this stuff, man, because like, I love talking to you because we both like, 
kind of get off on this idea so much that we could just ramble. Like if the cameras weren't on, we'd be having the same conversation. You know what I mean? And that's that's what I I dig about it. But at the same time, you have the same kind of fuck the man sense of humor, and and that's what it is. I've always had that at the basis of uh, of really. Uh, ignorance is trust and and I think people just giving all their trust like I haven't really thrown my weight on on, on a candidate as, as, but I, I love following you and in, in the Trump thing and all that because the thing, <laughs> the thing that Trump has done it's very punk rock in the sense that he's come out and he said all this shit that you're not supposed to say and because he thinks that which is re very respectable I mean I know there's a lot of people I hate him, so I, I'm not going to get into all that. But but I just think just to see what the – I've never watched debates, ever, not one year. This is the only year I've watched it because it's like for the first time you're like, oh, my God, like if he can just do this. Like he just rolled in and said, hey, man, I got money. I'm going to throw it at this. I'm not fucking taking nothing. Nobody, <laughs> I'm not, nobody's giving me money. So I'm going to come in. I'm not even going to take a salary when I get in the office. Like – the fact that you always just kind of thought you can't do that, like somebody who's just coming from this world can't just step into the presidency. But then you're like, well, if he can do that, you know, and of course, you got guys like Kanye saying they're going to run. But like, if he can do that, like, imagine what the actual role of the president is going to morph into. I mean, you know, you look at you look at some of these ideas of like bit nation, like somebody out there is going to decentralize a government and, and, and using technology and it'll be functional and it'll be an experiment. And. It might fail miserably, but dude, if it works, the rest of the world will become that way. It'll be just like, you know, we don't need necessarily these people who are being paid these immense amount of money to do all these things. You need a garbage man, but you don't need necessarily a, 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 a treasurer, you know, those kind of yeah. things. Like, like, honestly, there's a lot of things that are very old model. And like you said, they're, we are still interacting with even the internet is interacting with a very old world, but it's slowly replacing little factors. And now finance, this thing, that discovery of the having a trustless system, period, is like that's where it's at. I mean, you're, they're going to solve so many issues by using the same type of system. And I just, you know, I don't know. It, I'm rambling now. I just, I just think that it's fun to... It, it is fun to think about this stuff. And that's part of what is driving the value of sure, is people thinking tomorrow and the year and the year after uh, next year and so on and so forth. In the near future, in the distant future, at some point, people are gonna create all kinds of new shit around this stuff. And that's where the rarity becomes important because at that point, people realize it's actually worth something. So it's like a, a, a fortuitous circle. But uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the decentralization thing, if you think about what government is doing in theory, aside from stuff like maintaining borders and uh, providing pooled resources for an army and aircraft carriers and all that type of stuff. Yeah, just separate all, the military, yeah, you can separate. Yeah, aside from military super national stuff, all government is really doing is offering this service to all of us where when I write a contract with you that says that I'll do such and such by a certain date, uh, if I don't do what's said in the contract, you can come after me through the courts or if it's egregious enough, the government itself will, will do the the work of, of finding equilibrium and finding justice. But there are a lot of contracts where that's not enforced because it's not, uh, nobody has the money to do it. You know, they only go after you when millions of dollars are at stake, when not when 50 cents is at stake, not when $5 is at stake because it's not worth the lawyer's fees. So in the future, when you have computers and blockchain based networks that are backed up in 20,000 places or backed up in 200,000 different places all over the world, if the computer code says, these are the terms of the contract. Uh, if you're a driver for this network, you'll get paid 85% of the driving revenue. Uh, you don't have to worry about Uber dicking you over. You don't have to worry about Bank of America screwing you over because you're gonna get paid exactly what that contract says. And then that's when people are gonna look around and go, wait a second, then why do we need all these courts everywhere? Why do we need all these lawyers getting paid half a million dollars a year if this could all just be enforced by computer chips and by you know, an evolution of the watch, really, that's all blockchains are, is this really advanced way of guaranteeing that something actually happened when it said it happened. Yeah, man, that's, that's brilliant. I mean, you're right. You on it. Yeah, you nailing it on the head with that, dude, because you look at the way I, I got to read this, this Nick Zabo thing you're talking about, the, about the watch, because he's, he, I like his writing a lot. He's real smart. And, and, um, that's a very, very interesting concept because you're right. Blockchain is really this just going to the just 
atomic level of time and guaranteeing, you know, the value of everything. And like you said, you could like, what would be as far as money interactions go, you know, labor and being paid, things like that, all of that doesn't, you, don't need, you wouldn't have to be suing people for stuff. Like you, the manager, you could sue someone for taking like, you know, literally taking your wallet while you were sleeping and going into your computer and doing that. Like, that's one thing that's criminal activity. But like, if like the old days of rock and roll when managers would like steal all the money, from the band, you know, the band would be aware of the money and there'd be their own, it would, everyone was going to get paid out automatically. And, you know, like even the concept of, of uh, band members playing on records and stuff or film crews and things like that, the way that it's all done, you could set up the most complex back end sharing deal that involved everybody involved and probably everyone would make more money, including the networks. And it would always be done and taken care of. And certain, certain royalties would end at this point and certain ones would be that. And it'd be all automatic. And that to me is, is, is what is going to be the future, you know? Yeah, definitely. That that's going to be the future in some form is artists will not be able to be screwed over because it's just not going to be a part of the model. There isn't going to be some fat person sitting atop it with their hand in the flow of the money and then waiting on them for that, them to get the checks and then eventually give you your piece. And yeah. there's going to be more transparency. If, if revenue is produced from the sale of one of your files, you'll be able to see it on the blockchain immediately. So if you're not getting your cut that month from the smart contract, you'll be able to at least ask why and you'll be able to follow the money. And so uh, so somebody on Twitter says, I like that sword in the corner shooter. I guess oh. you have a, <laughs> you have a sword over there. Yeah, it's like, we borrowed it from a friend. Me and my wife were He-Man and She-Ra and we just haven't returned it. Our, our buddies, uh, Spooky Dan and Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> that, nice is, that is sweet. Hey, uh, we got We got to do another one of these soon. If you're in Colorado anytime soon, we'll do one in person. Yeah, man. And, uh, sure. I, I want to leave this idea with you, and then you can ramble about this for a little bit because uh, <laughs> this is something I just started thinking about the other day. Uh, Bitcoiners like to use the phrase of going to the moon for when we'll finally know that we've arrived because the price will be – for people who don't know what that whole going to the moon thing is about – I'll explain it in non-politically correct language. It means we're waiting for that moment when Bitcoin has proven itself. That's what everybody doesn't want to admit, but there will be a day when if everybody's using Bitcoin, necessarily the price in local currency is very, very high because of just how many units there are and how many people are using them around the world. So that's what going to the moon is about. But if you think about it, it's really... Uh, an achievement on par with us having gone to the moon because we're not going to get just small advances in society. We're going to get these huge advances that allow for all this crazy shit you and I are speculating about now. And when that happens, that's what creates the really high value. So it's it's a weird catch-22 to think about. It's still caught in the, uh, is it, you know, uh, the chicken or egg dilemma, as they call it. But uh, at a certain point, it's going to become so useful to so many people that, that that itself is going to kickstart the next wave of uses for this weird technology. It's it's a crazy thing to think about because once we're there, it really will be equivalent to hitting the moon. It's going to be like, oh, we don't need central banks at all anymore. Oh, we don't need iTunes or YouTube at all anymore. And that's the point we can wake up to. Yeah, man. I mean, you're so that that is so close. I think everyone says it's far kind of it's going to be like 10 years before it's all in place but i think like what you're saying like decentralized youtube decentralized music service i mean like even like publishing and licensing back back to music and and movies and stuff like like when i cut a song for instance i have this record coming out um in february called kuntosh and it's the majority of it is Giorgio Moroder material so i had to go and apply get a license for that material through the Harry Fox agency and I paid them. And then, you know, then I have a license to use those songs on my record. Then the, there's two writers on each of those songs and it's job, the job of like BMI and ASCAP in these, these, these places to keep track of what songs are being played on the air and what on radio and live. And then to pay these royalties to those writers. And then there's publishing companies like Universal and, and Warner Brothers and and they they give you these big advances and take your your publishing, but you end up not really owning your publishing anymore. They do for at least, sometimes 
in the older case, a lot of guys forever sold it. And some, and I had a publishing deal for a while and I, I got out of it. But those first three records I did, I barely make any money off of them, but they gave me advances back then. All of those things can be handled by code. Like where if I put this record out, I put it on the blockchain, these people wrote these songs, like instantly every everyone that is bought, all those people are automatically paid out. There's no need for Harry Fox. There's no need for ASCAP. There's no need, like ASCAP is when I write a song, I have to like publish it with them and that the blockchain would serve that. I can just publish it on the blockchain. So like all these things like that will, the union for instance, like the, the, what the union has their own things. If they get involved, um, that can also all be automated. So I never have to even deal with it. And the minute you buy this record, I get this much and Giorgio Moroder gets this much. And this other guy uh, that he wrote with a lot gets this much. And, and, you know, each one of these little things can be instantly taken care of and it can be linked to when someone else covers this song. Technology is getting to a place where it will be able to identify this, identify these songs, possibly the artist who they're covering Say say I want you you your band wants to cover one of my songs. You indicate that I get I'm aware of that. All of the correct money and publishing gets for your sales gets taken care of. Like there's so much that can be done by just like I think we're stuck in this MP3 uh, you know MOV file kind of world right now where you can just copy them and all that. But I think eventually the ones and zeros, the unique ones and zeros of this song that I wrote. Uh, will be looked at like a GBG type signature. So anytime anyone ever plays that on their their computer or anywhere, it is there is a blockchain that is aware of that, and therefore, like the streaming idea and all that, microtransactions will then just be taken care of to the artist and completely decentralized. And, I, and movies too. Movies are about to like they're about to have. They're, I mean, people aren't making great movies anymore unless they're extremely low budget because th there's just no money in it. Just like people aren't spending money making records anymore and it's changing the art. Do you know what I mean? And so I think I'm kind of looking forward to a time where, where there's a little more leeway given to the artists and the filmmakers and the writers and where they don't feel so strangled by the finances of it and are able to take some chances, more chances, you know? I think those are all awesome points to think about. I was just thinking about how, uh, as you're mentioning the different agencies that you have to pay out to talent agencies and music licensing agencies, whenever you want to produce a piece of music, uh, when you do away with those middlemen, as will happen when Bitcoin and smart contracting is more uh, commonplace, there will be some resistance and there'll be some resistance from the notaries. If they have a union, there'll be resistance from the companies that make the paper checks and the companies that make the plastic debit cards. There's going to be resistance at some point. And it's going to be kind of fun because you're almost going to know who the enemies of progress in our society are. It's going to be anybody who's against blockchains and Bitcoin because, you know, we are cutting out more middlemen than probably any other innovation ever. I mean, the iPod was innovative, but that only took on a small segment of music uh, at first. And now we're talking about taking on all of finance, all of central banking, all of cloud computing. And it's all possible due to the blockchain. And I don't think that these things are overstated. I think actually a lot of people are still understating the importance of this stuff in uh, early 2016. But thanks so much for joining me again. This has been a great chat. And uh, thanks to everybody who watched. And just let people know where to follow your work. Oh, yeah, man. Well, shooterjennings.com. Uh, I have a record label, uh, bcrmedia.com. That's I just uh, put my new record up for pre-sale last night. Um, that's where you kind of get all the stuff I'm working on. I got to say happy new year and rest in peace, Lemmy from Motorhead. Cause you just passed away. So, uh, you know, but I, I love talking to you, dude. I love, I always do. And you're, I consider you a dear friend. And I hope when I get there, it's funny cause you've never even been to a show. So I hope when I get to Colorado, you can come out to a show and then we can get some time in hanging, you know, and, and uh, if you come to LA, dude, I got a spare bedroom. You can always crash here anytime, even if I'm not here, man. So. Yeah, well, that uh, definitely sounds good in regards to Colorado. And uh, I haven't seen one of your shows, but of course I saw you producing that track. Oh, yeah. The, uh, so you produce tracks for motion pictures, and I was there one day hanging out, which is pretty cool behind the uh, nobody could hear me talking to you, the like sound room or whatever. But uh, that was a lot of fun, and it would be fun to actually see one of your shows for sure. Uh, so I will take you up on that. And I'll be in L.A. at some point, although what I'm trying to do is, is rebuild – uh, kind of a media scene here in Colorado. 
around what I want and just try to lure people out here to relocate because uh, I don't really have a burning desire to move back to LA. I was there for two years, had yeah. a lot of positive experiences like meeting you and meeting some other people. But now that I'm here, it's not a bad place. You know, people are humble and they have legal weed and they have an appreciation for things like Bitcoin. And it's just different. It's like a, it's like if the Midwest had legal weed and great skiing, what would it be? It would be Colorado. And uh, so it's a cool place. I don't want to leave it until I fully explored it. But I'll definitely take you up on visiting sometime. And uh, for everybody out there watching this, thank you so much for those of you who, who have held in there because there was a time where Bitcoin was not fashionable and where it seemed almost crazy to suggest that something that was constantly declining in value uh, was going to become so important. But it's the case, you know, this is really a matter of technology and it's uh, black and white TV to color TV, it's analog to digital, whatever analogy you want to make, blockbuster to Netflix. I still believe this is a very big one. And if you're totally new to it, there'll be some links in the description below to help get you started with Bitcoin. And uh, it's one of those things you can totally teach yourself. All the information is out there. Shooter Jennings did not go to Bitcoin school. I did not go to Bitcoin school. <laughs> you just read about it. And it, if it takes hold of you, you'll know it. And before you know it, you'll be a Bitcoiner. And thanks, everybody, for watching. And uh, that is it. Yeah, man. Thank you. Hell yeah.
esta idea me vino hoy especialmente cuando vi otra vez una chica ahí pidiendo dinero por la calle. Actually, I must say first this idea today I got especially when I saw again um, one girl begging for money in the streets. Me gustaría ayudar, pero yo tampoco me sobra mucho el dinero. I would really like to help everybody, but I, I don't have either too much money. And así que me vino la siguiente idea. So I got the following idea. It's, uh, it's más bien un juego. Uh, it's uh, rather a game. Uh, lo que es muy importante elegir un monedero de Bitcoin que solo tú mismo misma, tienes la llave privada. What is very important uh, to choose um, Bitcoin wallet a company which you only possess the private key for example uh, blockchain.info por ejemplo la empresa blockchain.info luego imprimir en papel um, la llave privada y también guardarlo tú mismo Then to print in paper the private key and uh, of course save for, for yourself that private key. Bueno, ya estamos imprimiendo, imprime por lo menos 10. So now we are already printing, so at least print 10 directions, 10 direcciones. Luego pones algo de Bitcoin, una cantidad, lo que, lo que te da la gana en esta dirección. Then you put some Bitcoin, uh, the amount, whatever you want, in, that, in these directions. Y la próxima vez que sales de casa ya tienes algo que dar a los que están ahí pidiendo por la calle. And the next time you go out of the house, you have already something to give for these people who are begging on the streets. Y por ejemplo, y claro, para tus amigos, amigas, and for your friends, of course. Eso da motivación a la gente para aprender Bitcoin y This gives motivation for the people to learn about Bitcoin. Y la parte del juego consiste en lo siguiente. And the game part uh, consists in the following. Explicas a la gente, mira, esta es la cl clave privada, que es la clave secreta. You explain to the people, look, this is the private key, which must be secret. And uh, you have it and uh, me. And uh, explicas, esa persona y yo mismo la tiene. Y antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié un poco de idea de hasta cuatro años. First, I thought of five years, but then I changed uh, my opinion to four years. Later, I explain. Después, lo expli explico por qué. Les dices, mira, tienes cuatro años para poner esta cantidad de Bitcoin a otra dirección. Si no lo, lo has quitado después de cuatro años, yo lo quito. So you explain them, you have four years to take this Bitcoin out of this direction, of this secret uh, key direction. 
if uh, you don't do it, uh, I do it after these three, four years. So you lose this. That's the this part of the game as uh, la parte del juego. He creado este hashtag uh, BTC4 para hacerlo un poco popular. I created this hashtag BTC4 to make it a little popular. Antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié a cuatro porque te has dado cuenta que en los Simpsons la gente tiene cuatro dedos. Y Solo do, Dios tiene cinco dedos. Um, first, I thought of five years, but then I changed my mind to four years. Um, did you notice that in The Simpsons, people have a four fingers and only God has five fingers. Uh, I'll show some pictures. Voy a enseñar algunas imágenes de los Simpsons. De los manos y dedos de Simpsons. Some pictures of the hands and fingers of Simpsons. Uh, pero antes quiero recordar que um, es muy probable que en en cuatro o cinco en los próximos años el valor de Bitcoin puede subir mucho. Just want to remember before that uh, the price of Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin can rise very much in these next years. Así que si solo pones una cantidad pequeña más tarde puede ser de gran ayuda. Even if you just put a little small amount later, it can be a big help. Uh, no solo para... Bueno, es un juego. <laughs> si la persona lo quita antes de cuatro años, para, es para esta persona. Si no, es para ti. Si te recuerdas y guardas bien la llave privada. So uh, it's, this is the game part, if uh, the, the person takes the money out, it's for that person, but if they forget it after these four years, you can take it out, and it can be really... <laughs> bueno, imprimir también la llave pública y la llave privada, y si por ejemplo, okay, first translate. Print not just the private key, but on also the public key. Así que si, por ejemplo, explicas a la gente. Mira, si alguna persona quiere enviarte Bitcoin, pero tú no tienes ninguna dirección, así que puedes dar este, esta llave pública a la persona. Mira, muy bien, la llave pública, no la llave secreta das a esa persona o cualquier persona y te pueden enviar un Bitcoin a esa dirección. So, remember, uh, the public key you can give to anybody and if somebody wants to send you some Bitcoin and, you, and this person doesn't have, have any, so you have already this public address where they can send you Bitcoin. ¿Qué es Bitcoin? Bitcoin es la primera moneda digital descentralizada. Los Bitcoins son monedas digitales que puedes enviar a través de Internet. Comparado con otras alternativas, Bitcoin tiene numerosas ventajas. Los Bitcoins son transferidos directamente de persona a persona a través de la red sin pasar por un banco u otro intermediario. Esto significa que las comisiones son mucho menores, puedes usarlo en cualquier país, tu cuenta no puede ser congelada y no hay prerequisitos o límites arbitrarios.
Miremos cómo funciona. Los bitcoins son generados en todo internet por cualquiera con un programa gratuito llamado Minero de Bitcoin. Crear bitcoins requiere una cierta cantidad de trabajo para cada bloque de monedas. Esta cantidad se ajusta automáticamente por la red, para que los bitcoins siempre sean creados a un ratio predecible y limitado. Tus bitcoins se guardan en tu billetera digital, que te resultará familiar si usas banca digital. Cuando transfieres bitcoins, una firma electrónica es añadida. Pasados unos minutos, la transacción es verificada por el minero y es almacenada permanente y anónimamente por la red. El software de Bitcoin es completamente abierto y cualquiera puede revisar el código. Bitcoin está cambiando las finanzas de la misma manera que la web ha cambiado el periodismo. Cuando cualquiera tiene acceso al mercado global, florecen grandes ideas. Miremos algunos ejemplos de cómo los Bitcoins están usándose hoy en día. Puedes comprar videojuegos, regalos, libros, servidores y calcetines de alpaca. Existen varias casas de cambio donde puedes intercambiar tus bitcoins por dólares, euros y más. Los bitcoins son una gran forma para que pequeños negocios y autónomos reciban publicidad. No cuesta nada empezar a aceptarlos, no hay cargos o comisiones y recibirás negocio adicional de la economía bitcoin. Para tus primeros bitcoins y más información visita weusecoins.com When I first heard this flat earth subject, I dismissed it without even giving it a second thought. But more recently, at the beginning of 2015, I ran across a few flat earth videos again. And while looking into the fake moon photos circulating around, I saw that people were claiming that the images from earth from space were fake as well. Pretty soon the flat earth subject became viral online. And after looking at the Apollo missions one night and coming to the conclusion that they were nothing more than a huge con game, it jarred my memory about something. And for a very specific reason, I decided to look deeply into the flat earth without just dismissing it blindly as so many do. Why did I look into it this time? Well, I do pray for knowledge and wisdom and discernment, but maybe the recent Apollo footage I watched helped. However, I live near a very large lake, Lake Ontario, and I happen to remember going to the beach as a kid and looking across the lake and seeing New York State coast off in the distance. I never ever thought anything about it ever, except I remember it being there when I went to the beach. Now, I've been to that beach a hundred times over the years. And once this topic gained more prominence in early 2015, the first video I saw explained the curvature of the Earth and what it's supposed to be in inches per mile. And it resonated with me because I remember that I could see clear across the lake to the other coast, something that broke all the sphere Earth rules. So with NASA fakery on my mind and the memory of seeing this coastline that supposedly was too far below the horizon for me to be able to see it due to the curvature of the Earth, I re-examined the flat Earth theory. And as unbelievable as it seemed, it started to make a lot of sense, especially since I did distinctly remember being able to see that far coast basically any time I was at my local beach. And as I've said, I've been there hundreds of times over the years. But even so, I went back to the beach recently and stood at the shore. I looked south and guess what? I could see the New York State coastline just like I remember. Now I googled the distance and it was approximately 36 miles. I learned what the curvature of the Earth is supposed to be exactly at that distance. And according to the people that believe in the sphere, and I found out that the coast should have been buried below my ability to see it by almost 900 feet. That part of the New York State coast had a top elevation of less than 300 feet. So that left at least a huge 600 foot discrepancy. And even more because I could see some of the height of the far shore. Was something really wrong with the reality that they've been selling us ever since we were born? Well, I ended up becoming a little fixated on proving or disproving the concept. And at first, I truly thought disproving the flat Earth would be rather easy. I thought there had to be a reasonable explanation why I could see so far beyond the so-called curve barrier. I learned about light refraction and superior mirages. I learned about perspective and horizons. I learned about how our eyes work. I viewed dozens of similar experiences on YouTube. I listened to experts and people who thought they had logical but spherical explanations. In fact, I tried for a few months to debunk the concept and just couldn't. The more I looked into it, the more sense it made and the less likely that the sphere model we've been spoon-fed since birth was a reality. It's just flat out wrong. And as more people shared their experiences and proofs online, it only added to my growing, pretty much unwavering belief that the world is not what we've been told. And learning about how our eyes work and how perspective work helps a lot with understanding sunrises and sunsets and ships disappearing hull first at sea and other supposed sphere earth proofs. I can't say for certain what shape the earth is or how big it is, or if there's an Antarctic ring or a barrier beyond it, or if it's an infinite plane. Maybe everything we theorize is not complete. There are so many possibilities that it blows the mind. And the flat earth has no real complete standard model because it's all based on us finding out things for ourselves. We agree on the facts and certain basics, but the rest is only hypothetical even if it seemingly makes sense. 
And as the evidence mounts for both the flat earth and against the sphere, I wanted to create a special place where folks can learn and share what they've learned with other supporters. Differences of opinion are certainly going to come forth and should be expressed openly. But remember that the goal of my videos and their corresponding threads is to provide the opportunity to use each of us to learn and grow in any area that any of us has a problem in. If there is a thing you can't understand, then ask. Someone will have an opinion and we can go from there. If you have a point to make against what is considered an accepted flat earth fact, please provide any relevant links or supporting proofs or videos. I am currently under the impression that the entire space program, even the low Earth orbit and all that is there, is really just a sleight of hand trick by a group of illusionists that have swindled the public, the governments of the world, the media, and us into believing a lie. Everybody, a small group of corporations and cabals have almost complete control over the entire financial, educational, high-level governmental and media systems, leaving it up to real armchair scientists and normal people that can critically think and recreate experiments themselves to independently prove or disprove any accepted line of thought about our reality. Look, I ain't the smartest man on the flat earth, but I ain't no dummy. I'm educated, and I never, ever questioned or ever thought of an alternative to a sphere Earth until this year. It never entered my mind to question this part of our reality at all, ever. But now I question everything. I'm a Christian, and I think I see the big picture. Thanks, Thanks for watching my video. If you'd like to see more proof against the heliocentric model and proof against the sphere, then make sure to subscribe to my channel. And if there's anything you disagree with, make sure you leave a note below explaining exactly why. Remember, folks, follow the golden rule. God loves you. We'll talk soon. Bueno, ahora voy a enseñar algunas imágenes de los dedos de Simpsons. Now I'll show some pictures of the fingers of Simpson. The four fingers. Los cuatro dedos y cinco dedos de Dios. Uh, four fingers and five fingers of God of Simpsons. Thirteenth of March.
Now, already some weeks ago, I have written on my to-do list to translate the video BTC4, hashtag BTC4. Schon seit ein paar Wochen habe ich äh, auf meiner To-Do-Liste geschrieben, ähm, den Video BTC4 in Deutsch zu übersetzen. Estoy segura que esta idea puede ayudar a mucha gente económicamente. I am sure that this can help many people economically. Ich bin sicher, dass diese Idee vielen Leuten äh, finanziell helfen kann. Y da motivación para aprender Bitcoin. And give motivation to learn about Bitcoin. Und motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo, económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low, economic. Im moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015 would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my for the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Vanos Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgenden, folgendem. Imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o mínimo diez o mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper, at least 10 or better 100. Bitcoin adressen in Papier ausdrucken, um, minimum 10 or besser gleich 100. Y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Y la próxima vez, cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero, and the next time uh, you see again a person begging for money on the street 
Und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas. And for your friends, of course. Und für deine Freunde natürlich. O tal vez eh, de probina en un restaurante. Or maybe a tip in a restaurant. Oder Trinkgeld im Restaurant. Bueno, a la hora de imprimir también copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin, de direcciones de Bitcoin. Or when you print the Bitcoin addresses, um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen druckt, auch die, äh, auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin-Adress-Schlüsseln, ähm, kopieren und speichern. Y a la hora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de... Abril 2015, escribir la fecha, más plus cuatro años, eh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015. Plus, plus four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus vier Jahre ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada. Tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin, eh, en estos cuatro años yo lo vuelvo a tener. Tener o sacar. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in this um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. Und dann erklärst du den Leuten, schau, das ist der private Schlüssel. Ähm, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin-Schlüssel. Wenn du äh, bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld, Bitcoin, nicht raus tust, transfer, äh, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. This way you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. Auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. En mi video antiguo.